and welcome back to Fox Popcast, the weekly pseudo acclimate rock table of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with nobody. Nobody showed up today. None of the regular hey. co-hosts are here. Well, hold on. <laughs> We're recording in the middle of the day, which didn't work for anybody's schedule, but we have a longtime friend of the show, Marone Langsner here. Hey, Marone, welcome back, and welcome to your first time on the hosting side, I guess. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's good to be here. Very, <laughs> very happy that you you guys did my pitch and that I could bring <laughs> some of my friends to, to join me in this specific adventure. So so this is exciting. One of the ideas of, of Vox Pop from the very beginning, we haven't done much of it, um, was always going to be, hey, you know, we might do shows that aren't from one of the regular hosts where somebody else just has an idea. And this was entirely <laughs> your idea. So I don't even have much for it. So what was the idea? What are we talking about today? So I am fascinated with the culture and rituals around vices. And had I gone the anthropology route for my doctorate, which was a thing I was seriously considering, one of the things I was going to explore was how do we handle the behaviors around the consumption of wine, whiskey, beer, marijuana, whatever. And the two things that I think have the most ritual around them Mm -hmm. and the most like pronounced connoisseurship and where connoisseurship is is a factor of enjoyment in a way that it is not for many other things are whiskey and wine and i myself was once a bartender a million years ago in a very fancy hotel bar where i was 23 years old and had 18 kinds of whiskey behind me and had learned how to bartend in new york so i knew how to do mixed drinks and whiskey connoisseurship then was not what it is today. So I remember getting a book and read, flipping through the book, reading, tasting, reading, tasting, reading, tasting, where it got to the point where my joke was like, yeah, well, I got to a joke where like, you know, I could smell something and tell you, ah, yes, McCollin, 18 years mm-hmm. old, mm-hmm. made on a Tuesday, Angus, I love his work. <laughs> <laughs> He's not wrong. And, <laughs> and, you know, I've left that industry, but I have two good friends who both have a level of understanding of their specific disciplines in alcohol that is above and beyond anything I have ever reached. And mm-hmm. I want to hear them talk about it. So I have... Kristen Lee Sargent, who is a sommelier who and a a performance professional, professional vocalist and actor, actor, and has her own wine label. I have. Well, hold on. Hi, Kristen. Nice to meet you. Good to be here. (laughs) And also, and we will will let them both introduce themselves as well, obviously. And Mm -hmm. I also have Patrick Marin, who is one of three people I've ever met who learned whiskey way better than I ever did. And okay. he is also a actor director and he is a bartender at a very top whiskey bar in New York City, but also has his own business where he runs whiskey tastings and whiskey lessons. I was hoping you'd just say he runs whiskey because I was like, oh, this could be. <laughs> the like, will be coming back about in the 2020s in honor. Honor of the Roaring Twenties. I'm hoping. I mean, like, I, I, and again, like, if you could do like a whole Dukes of Hazard thing, but without the Confederacy part, like, I'm all for you taking a Dodge Charger and just jumping it over shit. Yeah, listen to me and listen to me very carefully. <laughs> if you give me a car and if you give me whiskey, I will drive your whiskey. Perfect. That's what I want. <laughs> so, so yeah, so this is exciting because this this show has always been. Um, it's you know, it's the pseudo economic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing, and you know. The listeners can tell when we swear, but I um, we don't really talk about it that much. I drink usually beer, but throughout the entire show, every show. So this is actually interesting because we don't really talk about the the drinking part much. So I'm kind of excited about this. So nice to meet you both. Um, nice to meet you. Yeah, to meet you, Kristen. So you are you're the sommelier. So tell me a little bit about that. Just um, well, tell the listeners what that means. Yeah. So I'm so excited to be talking to you and talking for the audience. Um, and it's good for me to practice introducing myself concisely because it's been a, <laughs> a journey. Um, uh, I moved to New York to pursue uh, theatrical work and uh, had always studied wine. I was already, you know, read a lot of books about it and everything else. Anyway, uh, what I didn't anticipate is that I'd have a career transition into jazz. So at the at the moment, I'm about to release my third record in the jazz world. But that 
was not um, the credits didn't transfer from theater <laughs> and uh, operatic singing into jazz. So what kept me afloat during that time uh, was work in the wine business, which brought me to be uh, a sommelier at some pretty amazing fine dining restaurants in New York, uh, Gotham Bar and Grill. The Grill was my last gig. Um, so I left the floor about, I'd say, three years ago, stopped actually working in restaurants where I had also developed a small wine label called Two Notes, small case production out of California. So I've been kind of on both sides of the business and the roads kind of have converged lately because I have a series that's a podcast video slash article series called Jazz and Juice, where I kind of fuse uh, oh jazz, <laughs> uh, jazz research with wine. So like the first episode is about Bordeaux and Duke Ellington, and I talk about structure in jazz arranging and wine. So it's very, very niche. Um, but oh, no, that's, this, <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I'm at is like, I'm just I'm so happy geeking out over, you know, the finer points of spontaneous fermentation and also, you know, listening to some amazing live recordings and stuff like that. So uh, that's that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't even want to do the show anymore. I just want to listen to, to your show instead. That's, <laughs> that's, that's better. I heard that. It's very good. Patrick. Uh, well, so I similarly am an actor in New York trying to do all the things, but along the way discovered that bartending pays the bills pretty well and works for the night owl systems of a actor who would spend late nights in a rehearsal theater or a studio. Mm -hmm. uh, and along the way, that kind of got me, I, I fell backwards into being able to attend lectures and tastings and seminars for whiskey for some of the things that were being carried at the bars and restaurants I'd worked at uh, and, and became more knowledgeable. So for the last five years, I've been working at the same bar. Uh, I'm now head bartender. And part of my job is to go to whiskey tastings, go to expos and talk to brand ambassadors, master distillers, attend lectures now on Zoom, of course, and and do all of the things that just sort of continued to build a series of questions that I am too hungry not to answer. Mm -hmm. So I kept learning as much as I can without getting a chemistry degree or becoming a marketing expert. <laughs> Where's your bar? It's in Hell's Kitchen. It's called On the Rocks. 49. Yeah. Oh, my God. I've spent a Christmas Eve there. I've spent a lot of eves there. <laughs> Well, you need trouble. to spend a few more because we just reopened for the first time in 17 months. And I am so glad to be back at work. I, I love how anybody who has like, you know, kind of a fun job, you know, you try, you, you, you try to downplay the fun aspect of it. And then, oh, uh, so much fun. And, then and, and then like, but you try to, the, you know, the grind. Well, you know, I have to go to whiskey tastings. It's kind of, you know, it's a, it's a thing. It's my job. You know, I don't want to, you know, it's just the is right. Like, we have to talk about the line between addiction and. <laughs> And the responsibility, because as I'm sure Kristen can attest to the rinse and spit nature or the if I'm going to spend the entire day tasting wines and whiskeys, you have to you have to cushion everything else that you're doing. So you're not shit faced at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, and I'm sure it does get I mean, it is a job. It, you know, it is work. It's, it's work yes. it, like at, at a point in which you're doing something that um that other people do for fun to an excess that you're doing it for um for work it does lose something and or, or become monotonous or hard or things that you would you'd never think i i was for work at one point i was working on a on a paper on an academic paper on pornography and my wife walked in one day and she, she's like what are you she's like what are you doing and i'm like i'm counting penises stop talking i'm gonna damn it <laughs> and then i had to go back and like you know and like when you when you're sitting there going frame by frame through you know through footage of orgies trying to count genitals it stops being even remotely sexy <laughs> like it, it was just mm -hmm. like it's like this is this is work so yeah so you guys are you guys work in something that I mean I can't imagine at the end of the day you are still drinking wine or whiskey for work so there's got to be some aspect of fun to it yeah. um, I, you know I feel pretty passionately about you know our relationship to alcohol has a lot to do with us and where you are I, a wine tasted in a portfolio tasting uh, with kind of you know bedlam around and fluorescent lighting and you know 500 other things you want to taste after it does not mm -hmm. taste the same as when you are sitting 
in beautiful lighting at leisure with a loved one able to focus like it simply doesn't and it, I think uh, I'm nervous because I know I'm on the academic podcast I'm thinking of the Heisenberg yeah, principle it's just <laughs> academic All right, well, someone yeah, will correct me but it's just that you know we aren't the control uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to you know the expertise or the enjoyment of wine I mean things taste different depending on the context that you're in and that can be something about at least on the wine side for professionals because you get uh, probably fatigued in a lot of ways but certainly palate fatigue because yeah. the manner in which you taste is so um, is unlike anything that a, a casual consumer would do so suddenly you start craving things that might might not be as successful for a person who's just having a glass of wine at the end of the day or with a meal but because you've tasted you know 50 uh, oaky chardonnays the one that has got screeching acidity at the end of the day that might just be really different wakes you up and that'll be the thing you go for so um we kind of have to cultivate the ability to understand where i am at this moment and where you know i have this thing i haven't like uh i don't know trademarked it yet but the tasting spiral like where i put me at the middle of it the 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 taster is within the tasting experience and i feel Mm -hmm. like i we sometimes uh forget that especially in this very academic way a lot of people approach wine like it's you know a graph and we're going to chart it and you know, our own subjectivity is almost irrelevant. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I get that. I, um, I haven't been able to trademark anything that cool yet, but I've also <laughs> tried to provide for people who are willing to get the full show at the bar or do the private tastings an understanding of where the whiskey's been and where we've been and to, to give them a sense of context when they're drinking, like mm-hmm. you're saying, because it's one thing to do a, a almost a conveyor belt of tastings versus, as you say, sitting around drinking with a loved one and more relaxed settings. To me, it's usually a comfy wooden chair or wicker chair on a backyard with my feet in the grass, no shoes on. Mm. Yes. Yes. But, you know, that's sort of I feel like uh, in the performing arts, it's similar where uh, successful performers, I think, make you under you really feel like you're in the place. You really feel settled, like it's special that I'm here right now. And then you're willing to receive whatever that performer has to offer you. And I feel like with wine, I'm not sitting around meditating every time I have a glass of wine. Don't get me wrong. But I've noticed that preparing myself for the experience of the wine is as important as my ability to, like, rattle off a bunch of citrus fruits in case I seem to smell them. And can we talk a little bit, Kristen, you have a thing that you say on your venues where you say knowledge is pleasure. And <laughs> Trademark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great phrase and it is something that I think a lot about connoisseurship and like kind of what's the line and relationship between connoisseurship and snobbery and people mm. who reach the level of expertise that like you and Patrick have where you are putting your expertise in the service of someone else's tasting experience. And many times to have a level of connoisseurship where you really understand the whiskey or the wine takes a lot of money. So Mm. it's not like really, really serious wine or whiskey connoisseurship is a fine is a is a financial uh, I won't say burden, but is a financial commitment. And the people who often make this commitment to get really good about whiskey either work in work in hospitality at some level. And typically it's a fine hospitality situation or they have very high paying jobs or come from a lot of money and are able to really develop their own taste and palate. Because something mm-hmm. like you know, one of the things in, in, in one of my parallel lives, parallel careers, I work in high end real estate and one of the things I look for in terms of property value is I say, you know, go to the bodega, tell me what beers you see, and I'll tell you how that neighborhood's doing. Because if you've got Icelandic IPA, that's a thing. And go to the nearest liquor (laughs) store and tell me the most expensive bottle you see. Mm -hmm. Because if you're seeing a $800 bottle, that that establishment feels that someone within walking distance is going to spend $800. And and I'm smelling an app opportunity here somehow (laughs) of like neighborhoods buy the two high-end spirits it's in the bodega. <laughs> I mean, it's, like, it's an interesting, I mean, the correlation is there. It's like 
you know, fair housing law doesn't let me talk about demographics or crime. No, but it also I mean, I would I would also imagine it doesn't stop at just financial class. I mean, like if I mean, and not this is not a judgment towards Marone personally. I have known him for many, many years, but one could also do this for fair housing laws that aren't just about crime or or like you could you could almost certainly make assumptions about race um, based oh, yeah. on if you go the, into if you go into the bodega and see certain or you go into the liquor store and you see certain things that are that have associations, then yeah. Right, right. So and it's I mean, these stereotypes about, you know, the kinds of alcohols that black people drink versus white people versus Hispanic people, they are stereotypes, but they're stereotypes, not necessarily even because people actually in, uh, prefer them, but because they popularly occur in yeah. through capitalism often enough that you're going to see. Um, I mean, and on the other hand, you know, I'm I am not a I am not a millionaire gangster rapper, but I do enjoy Cavassier. I really like it. So I have a bottle. I will, you know, perhaps I should go drink, get, get some and there's drink a great, during the show. Um, <laughs> it's a great show. It's a podcast uh, called Wine and Hip Hop, where mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's the intersection of fine wine and hip hop music is happening. And that's been going on for a while. They would could probably, you know, kind of reframe some of that because there's been a long relationship with especially champagne houses and oh, yeah. um, that kind of music. You know, I, I think, I mean, this is tricky, right? Because we're really talking about wealth inequality and mm -hmm. we're really talking about, you know, right. systemic it, and, I, you know, if everybody had extra money to burn, not everyone would spend it on things that they can eat or drink. You know, yeah, that's, sure. that's that's where my priority is. But, um, you know, certainly like fashion is a big one. And I've noticed I worked in wine retail in, in Midtown Manhattan for a while. And the people who would come in wearing Prada were not interested in also getting, you know, a five hundred dollar bottle of wine. It's just they're yep. different. They're different pleasures. So I can only speak to the ones I care about. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's I think it's probably probably unfair for us to say that, you know, any group of people, you know, if they had the money would be buying the wine we've all decided is is the best, you know. So, so then I have a question. I mean, you guys both I mean, as professionals, it, it, both of you as a job are going to taste relatively high end liquor. Right. That is a thing thing that is going to happen frequently enough, you know, just for work. Right. Is it a thing where I know for me, right? Like it is, I am required to be able to talk to you at length about, uh, about James Joyce or about Fitzgerald or about Mina Loy, like all these canonized classic authors. Right. But three weeks ago on this show, I spent an hour and a half solid talking about how Fast and Furious was the most important film franchise of our time. Right. And because, because so, you know, and it's like, it, it's not that I am not cultured. I mean, it's my job to be cultured in a certain way, but you know, there is a, I, there is a certain thing that, you know, lo, you know, low browness, right? Like, is there a thing where you go, yeah, yeah, but OK, I, I get what my job is, but I would like a Bud Light today. Is that OK? Can I just have a Bud Light? <laughs> you know, uh, do you want to take yeah. this? Uh, well, <laughs> what, there is a lot to dive into there. Um, and I appreciate that. I, I will try and start with the first part of the low brownness and say, yes, um, the the more I drink and talk about whiskey, the more I I I, I, um, I settle is not the right word. The more I have to assess the bars I walk into and acknowledge that I may be in the snobby sense, lowering my standards for the whiskey <laughs> that I'm drinking that night. Mm -hmm. um, because as as we say, all the, the sociopolitical elements, the financial situations, location, all of these things will factor into what a bar, restaurant, liquor store, bodega thinks they need to carry. And, and I think to some degree, well, it is wonderful to taste thousand dollar bottles of whiskey to be able to talk about selling it. Some days I do just want Jameson on the rocks, partly because it's all it's there, partly because that's kind of what I'm in the mood for the day. Mm -hmm. yeah, and um, some of the very common things are actually really good examples of form. Yes. So like and, Jim Beam White is a really good example of form. Absolutely. It's what, what it, does that mean? Is, so <clears throat> in the sense that there are so many things within the worlds of wine and whiskey, though they all have to be, you know, fermented, in my case, distilled, her case, fermented and aged in a barrel. You at some level are still baking, breaking things down to the basics. Whiskey has to be made from cereal grains aged in a barrel and 
over time or the type of grain changes the style of whiskey. That's just choosing the branch of the tree you want to sit on. Mm -hmm. That is the so chemical some, recipe. Yes, the chemical recipe. So I could make use of a Johnny Walker red to to use a, an easier follow metaphor to be like, OK, you know what? I'm a, I'm in more of a single mood today than single malt mood today than I am a bourbon mood. My personal taste buds, the corn is just too, too sweet. So I might gravitate more towards a blended scotch, whereas some people might see it as inferior because I want those woody notes. I want that that bite. I want just a little bit of peat. And so the the nature of to me the ability to offer people knowledge as both power and pleasure is is to let them understand the choices in front of them so that they are making an informed choice mm. because no matter what bar you walk into if you know the stuff that goes into it even if it's just a quick baseball card stat flip in your brain then you have comfort and control in the bar and you're not going to be intimidated to spend money you don't want to spend you can look at it and go oh i'm probably a little bit more expensive than i'd want but i know what that taste is going to be like because i understand that category even in just one or two broad strokes mm -hmm. that thing was what was lacking on to in a tasting so that they have the tools to choose for themselves, which is to me an important part of understanding this very uh, pr possibly pretentious category. Yeah, I like I like how you talking about being informed, especially when we start to put labels on things like lowbrow or highbrow, which is really we're just talking about price for the most part. Like for mm -hmm. me, uh, when I'm drinking, not tasting, uh, I love actually all times of year, but especially spring and summer for rosé, because at the high end of the category, the most you can spend on a bottle of rosé is more or less like maybe maybe forty five dollars, but you know thirty bucks is usually the most expensive rosé you'll see on a store shelf, and um, everything's young. It's meant to be consumed the same for the most part, the same vintage it comes out in, yeah. um, and it's really fun. So I get to explore uh, a, a vast array of different things. I don't expect that much from the wine, but it can offer a lot. Uh, the thing is, is is trying to find you know which I wish there it existed. Like I want a fine white Burgundy that costs tastes like $80 that cost 25. It doesn't really exist once you start to learn what's in it. I also feel like there's this, you know, a aw burgeoning awakening um, up and commitment to organic wines and wines that are respectful of the environment from which they come. But I also think that extends for me to the people who make the wine. And when I see a wine that comes from Europe, that's less than $15 to start doing the math of how much <laughs> did it cost to make this and how much did the people get paid that make it. And I know, especially once you get distributed in the States, there's all these middlemen that are making more money than the winemaker ever will. Um, that juice might have cost like 50 cents. So, yeah. I, I mean, let me just manage my expectations when I think about you know, what I'm buying and how much I'm going to enjoy it. So like literally for jazz and juice, I love the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, literally just calculating postage. You're saying like, yeah, pretty, pretty <laughs> much. Just like, like just the shipment, like the cost of moving it on the boat from England to America is uh, at bare minimum, a fixed cost <laughs> that you, what, that one has to take into account. You're saying, there was right. a year. especially with tariffs and everything else. Yeah. There was one year where Beaujolais Nouveau was shipped in plastic bottles because it's, it's a wine that's meant to be drank young. And they there was a note with it that said, we're shipping this in plastic this year because we're reducing mm. shipping costs and fuel consumption. And this is about the environment and keeping the cost to you. And that same winemaker did not continue doing that. So I'm curious how much of that was about the snobbery of people who are even even something like Beaujolais Nouveau. Which plastic is, to save the environment. I'm sorry. No, it's that too. Well, I mean, I don't know what the math is of like plastic <laughs> versus glass. But if it's about fuel consumption, mm -hmm. then maybe. Yeah, and it might be. So, like, there's there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, and like, yeah, you're right. Plastic to save the environment versus glass. I don't know, but <laughs> well, it, but like, what it, did it not continue? Because people screw. wouldn't drink out of plastic. I think it's the the screw cap, the stealth enclosure thing is where this. At least I could I could speak more knowledgeably about this. The screw cap, which. Um, well, I, I'm a big proponent of cork because when they get cork from the tree, they don't actually cut a tree down. It comes from the bark and then the bark grows mm -hmm. back. So you're actually supporting forest growth and mm -hmm. uh, they are recyclable, even though um, those areas where you can recycle them are becoming more scant. But um, anyway, but cork is 
The stove enclosures are kind of amazing and they do a great job of keeping the wine fresh and free of all oxygen. And there's a larger conversation to be had. But for our argument's sake, let's just say that for a lot of wines, the screw cap is actually a better method to avoid cork taint and other things. It's missing something, isn't it, though? I mean, yeah. the, the, the theater of opening of, of uncorking a bottle of wine at the higher end, even knowing yeah. what I know, I don't I don't like cr- hearing the crack of <laughs> breaking a seal on a wine i have that question for you for Kristen. so given you know what Maroon just said you know talking about transporting in plastic bottles or just what you said about the uh, about removing the cork i i'll take champagne part of the ritual of champagne is it doesn't like more so than what the champagne could taste like more so than the so, so than the brand more so than whether it's sparkling wine or champagne the most important thing in champagne period is popping that cork and just making you know making it pop like that's part of the experience right like on new well, year's yeah. eve you're on new year's eve if you're it, it doesn't feel like new year's eve if you don't get to make go, make it go pop that's part of it so mm-hmm. how much of how much of this is purely performative right like if you can't ship it in plastic because people think it feels cheaper or it feels less environmentally sound even if mathematically it might be because because i imagine their their thought was plastic is physically lighter than glass so therefore we can do less fuel consumption even though you know the vast majority of plastic or glass neither of them are recycled they probably should be but the vast majority isn't right so it's possible that like the environmental footprint on shipping a bunch of plastic containers across the atlantic just happens to be lower I don't know. Well, I will have to say, I have to I hate to burst the bubble, but in the in the sommelier community, mm-hmm. if you pop a bottle, you're out of there. <laughs> the okay. actual the, the sign of a well opened bottle of champagne is actually just the slightest. Okay, so yeah. so that's, but, but that's a question, yeah. right? What is it? What that's happens there? About the line between connoisseurship and snobbery, right? Yep. Oh. <laughs> and like, and I think like, because I think we, we, I'd like to go back to that thread because mm-hmm. there is something to be said for you know I you know worked in some fancy bars and restaurants you know, a long time ago, but we had very specific champagne protocols, and it was supposed to be really gentle. And if something flew across the room, like you know that's also mm-hmm. you know a health hazard. And then you get into the world of champagne sabering, which for people who don't know, that's when you open champagne with a sword. Mm-hmm. You must yep. be able to do that given your your background in violence <laughs> i've never had the opportunity yeah like but, not, I mean, uh, but it's a very very specific i don't know if very, I could. very specific high-end way of high end's the wrong word Marone, specific- i will gladly buy cheap champagne so that you and i can practice that i would i would practice I, it as well yeah see this is, i'm like I'm, I'm literally thinking this is a side tangent to like just all alcohol stuff but i'm thinking about the way that i actually hold a katana if i want to cut somebody versus what one would have to do in order Order to open the sword like it would be like i know how to use a sword and yet i don't think i could just do it certainly not on the first try it, it would be it would, it's, you it would chill be entirely an art yeah you chill the top so it's brittle uh-huh. and you slide it along very quickly and it just pops off the top and theoretically the pressure of the gases blows away what? any any um gla- of the gases blows okay. away any glass fragments so it's safe to drink okay. and the story behind it was when some army invaded France and the officers had the champagne and just opened it with their sabers and drank out of it. But now it is like a very celebratory way of opening champagne that is specific and probably not the greatest idea. And you probably lose a lot of champagne. Right. So you shouldn't be doing it for something that's that good. Well, that's kind of that's kind of what I was getting at with the pop thing. Right. In Kristen's point point, when you're drinking as a sommelier, when you're doing the cultured and sophisticated drinking of champagne, right, as a I am doing a champagne tasting, that is very different than i just won the kentucky derby or miss america or whatever you know Mm -hmm. or cmu buggy right like there have been a lot of events and seeing this is a that's a super inside reference for a very specific listenership but there are a lot of events where one celebrates the event with a champagne bath right and that's and think about how much champagne i have wasted just by pouring it over people that has nothing to do with you know the actual taste of the champagne. It's just console myself by thinking it probably wasn't real champagne. Almost because, certainly not. Yeah. Because why would it, because because if I if I intend to pour most of it over somebody, I would rather spend 
six dollars or less if I possibly can. Right. <laughs> you know, like this is why I've never sabered because it involves buying something I don't mind wasting, which yeah. means it's something I don't want to drink. And if it's something I do want to drink, I'm going to waste it because I'm going to have to make some mistakes. And that would just break my heart. So <laughs> Maron's going to have to learn how to do this for me. Well, <laughs> I'm, but that brings it back to some degree to the to the snobbery versus culture approach of, as you exactly said, if I know that's how cheap it is, to some degree, I don't want to drink it because we've continued to refine our palates to the point where once we know what we do and don't like, it's not necessarily about wealth at that stage. It's about that we don't want our taste buds to suffer through a thing that we think is inferior taste. Okay. Right. And well, that's the priority of what's inside the bottle. But, you know, working in retail for a long time, sometimes... Someone's going to get the most pleasure out of what's on the outside of the bottle, the performance aspect of how yep. it's being served, like at a club with, you know, you know, sparklers coming off the top of it and everything else. That might be <laughs> more fun than really just concentrating on something that tastes great. Mm-hmm. Drinking it out of a flute rather than a wine glass. That's a big um People have been more often choosing to drink sparkling wine out of a more conventional wine glass, sure. depending on the champagne, which takes some of that. You know, the flute is kind of a symbol of, of champagne and enjoyment. Mm-hmm. So it depends where you derive your pleasure from. And, you know, I, I'd love for me, it really matters. Like I want a small producer. I want something that has a distinctive sense of terroir and all these things. But some other people, I'm buying a present for my boss and he knows that if I get this yellow label that, you know, I mean it. <laughs> and it, that that mm-hmm. label is going to uh, translate something to this person. And I'm not so sure the taste is what matters. So it just kind of depends on yeah. what on what actually matters to you, which isn't to say, you know, it is not to necessarily be snobby about it. It's just a different different priority, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, and and even like, I guess, non special in the non specialist world of alcohol going to scotch where if you go to the uk when you order scotch or if you're if you're at a bar that serves scotch there are little pitchers of water Mm -hmm. and you get your scotch and you pour in a little bit of water and you're not having a tasting you just ordered a scotch yeah and there's all of this little ritual around it and i i've found that most substances with any intoxicating value you know legal illegal alcohol smoking (laughs) whatever that they have cigars have a lot of ritual around them as well Mm -hmm. the rituals of consumption who keeps those who learns that who teaches them to you that's the class thing Mm. that's a class thing and that's also like kind of an across the board thing culture thing too hold on hold on what do you mean by across the board so if you're going and you're having you're you're going to a bar in scotland and Mm -hmm. you you get some you get some famous grouse Mm -hmm. which is a pretty you know consumer level perfectly good blended scotch whiskey and you would pour water into that the state with this in out of a similar glass and similar pitcher than if you ordered a 25 year old single malt that cost as much at the bar as five as a case of whiskey would at from the from the liquor store okay and it's the same thing and it's something that and it's a this is how you drink whiskey you yes. wouldn't do that to rum you wouldn't sure. do okay, that to gin so because alcohol ends up being specific to different cultures and you're living in the united states living in the northeast where we have a whole lot of different cultures together, we can go to different places that will serve the alcohol of wherever their culture is. So, and get it in the style of that culture. And right. if you're someone like, let's say you're you're just you're ju- you're you've just come of age, you've just started going to decent bars, you just started drinking whiskey. What's the experience of whiskey versus, and what what could set someone down the path of whiskey, down the path of wine? down the path of, you know, really intricate microbrewery beers versus, you know, just give me, give me a gin and tonic. Okay. And how what do you do see you, at the bar around this? Oh, I'm sorry. Maroon. Yeah. What, I mean, what I see at the bar, what I see among people who, what, what I used to do when I was a bartender and this was, you know, as someone who learned, had to learn quickly because all of my clientele knew more than I did. And this is, you know, one of the things that got me thinking about all of this in general was once I learned and, you know, did my quick crash course, I learned that I could do, I could take someone on a journey of scotch and say, okay, we're going to work our way towards Lefroy. And Lefroy, for people who don't know, used to have an advertising campaign of on a scale of aught to 10, it's never gotten anything between a one and a nine. So you either love it or hate it. It's super peaty. It is a very strong space. It's very specific. 
specific if you're not used to it. Mm -hmm. It is a lot. And it was my late father's favorite, so it has a special place for me. But if I wanted to get someone to appreciate Lefroig, I would who did not know whiskey at all, we would start with a blend. It's like, okay, let's talk about what you have in the blend. And then we would work our way. And you know, sure. there's there is palate fatigue. So you have to do this in like four tastings. And the yeah. pours in, in London at the time, the government mandated pours were very small. And you would do it in four or five tastings where they would get to the Lefroig and they'd say, Okay, I see why this is good. And each bottle, a friend of a friend once said to me about my whiskey collection that I don't collect whiskeys, I collect experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting way to see it too. But with, if you take someone who's never really had whiskey and you go, you put it in this glass, you pour in exactly this much water or you pour mm -hmm. in as much water to taste, but I recommend this much. And you've suddenly developed, this is how I consume this particular alcohol. If they go and order Kahlua, they're not going to do the same thing. So, sure. And I see the same things like, you know, things happen around wine because the glasses that you drink wine out of are very specific and y yes but here, here, here's where I the weird quibble and this goes um, this is what Kristen was talking about earlier about about you know where we talk about the the class and I think you said what you really mean is you mean expense right like that's what yeah. you're saying you know, this is high, highbrow we mean it's expensive I would argue that these rituals rituals of pageantry are connected mm -hmm. to cultural consumption and yes. I'm specifically leaving alcohol out for the moment because but now I'm going to bring it in. I I would argue that the same way one decides, you know, how do I consume this whiskey? Like what is the correct way to pour this whiskey? What's the correct way to pour this champagne? Um I I mean I made I made the um the earlier comment about hey, I've just won a race. Um it would be weird to win to like win the race of your life and then to very very carefully you know uncork a bottle of a bottle of you know thousand dollar champagne everyone pours in exactly a flute like you're you're supposed to be screaming and hollering and oh my god i just won i just won you know whatever race it is like like it's supposed to be a thing where the the pageantry is in the excess and the waste and i would say that like you know i would say there are rituals of consumption it would be very weird to go to an American football game and order any kind of beer to be drunk in a chilled mug. That is something that happens. Like, like I, like if I'm going Bud or or well, the Guinness box. and nobody would drink it there. Well, maybe I've done it. I've I've done VIP boxes and it and VIP boxes at NFL games. Um, like so, I've I've actually gone to one where you know, in my former life where I got to hang out with, you know, richer people than academics where I've sat with executives in a VIP box at a Steelers game. And the oddness of it is weird because you'll, you'll drink, you'll, you'll have an option of very expensive wine or champagne. And then also there's Iron City beer. Iron City beer is a ridiculously cheap beer from Pittsburgh for the listeners who don't know, who don't know. But it makes sense in the context of being being in a Steeler game. It is oddly confusing to be like to drink you compare it to Natty Ice for Long Islanders or perhaps Narragansett for New Englanders. <sighs> mm, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe slightly better. And I mean slightly. Exactly. <laughs> I don't like Natty Ice. I, I, I would say it, I would say I would say it is better than Natty Ice, but but I mean we're 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 splitting hairs here at that point. So, but right. yes, I like your the, the point you make is is makes it's so totally sound. I feel like the big distinction is: are we treating the spirit or the or the wine as the focus, or is it an accompaniment to an experience? Yes. What's the experience? Is the experience the is the experience the football game, or is it the beer? Right, and that I think is important to to acknowledge. Uh, circling back a little bit to um, Kristen's metaphor of the flute and the wine glass, mm -hmm. the same thing is true with a whiskey rocks glass or a Glen Cairn. If mm -hmm. I put that same famous grouse next to Marone's. Lafroig in two Glen Cairns, and someone who doesn't see me grab those bottles drinks both of them. It's they may appreciate uh, that's the uh, this tulip looking glass with the very short bulbous stem. 
Oh, and see, I learn something every day. And sometimes yeah. they have hats. Sometimes um, they have covers to hold the. Sorry, yeah, you know, the sometimes they have hats. It depends yeah. on the level of theater. Mm-hmm. Um, where, uh, whereas, if if we were to put the two next to each other, somebody might actually prefer the the famous grouse because they don't not even know any better, but so much as their taste buds appreciate that next to the other yeah. because they're not being yeah. led by the theater of the bottle label they already know to be expensive. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's so interesting. But the theater is, I mean, just like real theater, that's important, right? Like I can I can tell you as a, as a film critic, as you know, as a trained professional, I'm not, I, I don't test, taste alcohol professionally, but I do judge books and movies professionally, right? So mm-hmm. I can... I can tell you, I, I mentioned um, Fast and Furious, which I loved. I, we did a show on that three weeks ago. Go back and listen to, you know, I am not being ironic. I adore those films, right? I can tell you why Fast and Furious does not belong in the same category as I'm trying to pick a great Oscar movie. Moonlight. Moonlight yeah. is a Moonlight is a phenomenal film that does that is doing something very, very different, making very, very different um, statements about masculinity and race than Fast and Furious does. And yet I, I personally would argue that the statement that Fast and Furious makes about race and masculinity is just as important as the one Moonlight makes. But I understand why one's more culturally and I'm going to use the term, even though I think it's artificial, one is more culturally sophisticated or highbrow because a bunch of people like me decided to call it that. But that is a but that's artificial, point. right? Like if if I happen to really like Natty Ice, I like Natty Ice and you can it doesn't matter what wine or whiskey you serve me. If that's my drink of choice. It's my drink of choice. One of the things I appreciate uh, why I'm, I'm glad I'm in a cultural space as well as the wine space is that everything you just said, Mav, I couldn't agree with more. Unfortunately, um, you, you know, anyone can get a Netflix subscription and watch Moonlight right. and watch Fast and Furious. And when it comes to wine and spirits, I would love to be able able to have a, a collective conversation about like, you know, Domain Romani Conti, you mm-hmm. know, versus a more simple, you know, versus a Pinot Noir that's, you know, $30 from Santa Rita Hills. But we can't have that conversation, really. And right. the cl- there's no the way class excludes to- people. It's exclusive because I can't I cannot just walk into my my local bodega and buy a thousand dollar bottle of wine. I just can't. There's not enough of them. They're right. just, you know, whether or not they're even expensive. There's just a lot of things. Yeah. There is no the supply can't even maybe meet the demand even if the pricing were there would be some barrier to and mm-hmm. whiskey is all about that i know there's there's certain bottles of whiskey they can get expensive at auction but it's oh, yeah. really just because there's only so much pappy to go around right exactly oh, yeah. is it time is it time to drop that word in conversation <laughs> I, did, I did drc no, already so no, I, I appreciate the layup but I'm actually going to sidestep it for just a second because I think we're we're burgeoning on one of my other favorite words when it comes to talking about these cultures and these rituals, which is irreverence. Mm-hmm. Where is that line between putting the little glass hat on your little glass of whiskey or <laughs> using a saber when it comes to champagne? I'll, I'll actually, let's throw it into a theater metaphor. Where is the line between smiling and nodding because you know Shakespeare is smart and where is the line between bursting out loud laughing because there's a dick joke in Shakespeare? Yeah. Well, or where's the line of just, I mean, to your thing about, um, to Kristen's thing about, you know, experience, uh, the very, the amount of theater one gets to experience if one does not live literally in New York City or uh-huh. London or Paris, the, you know, like three, three places on the planet. Your 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 level of accessibility drops dramatically from what we call the you know the the most culturally sophisticated theater. Um, is it? I mean, not that I don't have theater that I can go to in Pittsburgh. I absolutely do, right? But um, but I I mean I used movies before, but better yet to look at uh Hamilton, right? Like yeah. everybody had access to Hamilton as of this last year because they dumped it on <laughs> Disney Plus. But before before exactly. Exactly 12 months ago, it's July 2021 as we record this before July 2020, Hamilton, um, like going to Hamilton literally yep. involved winning the lottery. It was called that <laughs> <laughs> like you literally had to buy a lottery ticket in order to have a chance to experience Hamilton. But we called it like, like oh, wow, have you seen this? It's this, it's this massively culturally experience, uh, cultural experience. And maybe maybe what we're talking about is alcohol that is free, not free to the masses, but, you know, available to the masses, right? Like no one, 
no one has to work hard to get a Bud Light. If you want one, you know how to get one, right? Like if you if you if you want a bottle of of I can't think of of Behringer's wine, you can get one. Um, Behringer's White Zinfandel. It's my favorite wine, and I've had and I've had much more expensive ones. It's my favorite. <laughs> um, so I can, but I can get one whenever I want for right. ten bucks. Yes, yeah. and and that's it's it's what I happen to like, right? What do you drink your Behringer's out of? Um, I drink. Uh, well, do you do you drink it out or? of a coffee cup? Is it out of a coffee cup or is it out of a stemmed glass? And why? Me a, stem gla- me a stemmed glass, but not my most expensive stem glass because. But I'm crazy. <laughs> I've got, I've got okay. like, I've got like lots of weird little rules that are idiosyncrasies that are just because I'm nuts, right? Like, uh, I mean, it's it's like asking. Um, I mean, and again, it also it also depends, right? Am I drinking it? Um, am I drinking it with dinner because I, you know, I I want or after dinner? Actually, I would never drink uh, white zen with dinner. I, it would be an after dinner drink for me. But like, am I doing that or am I drinking it in my hot tub? Because then I'm drinking it out of a solo cup. You know what? It's, inter- <laughs> it's interesting because this is your own personal ritual, and I feel right. like yes. this is very Thank uniquely you. American. Because one of the things that I love, I'm I'm not an anthropologist in this way, but I love what I have learned of the drink drinking traditions of other cultures. And uh, usually they're deeply tied to the history of the region of where, you know, usually it's because the spirit or the wine is indigenous to that region. And there's all of these things that are sort of imbued in that ritual uh, for themselves. And in the U.S., uh, you know, for better or worse, we get to make our own kind of culture. So you have your white Zin ritual. And I know at, at our place, we've got our own way of doing things. And so that's beautiful. But it also kind of means that we're fragile fragmented that way. Like I think about mm-hmm. for me, it's very telling for me that in the United States, what I see when we talk about ritual and alcohol, it's either total excess. You know, you talked about the 20 mm-hmm. 21 year old birthday party, right? All I can think about is drinking too much, you know, yeah, of I don't remember all kinds of stuff. It's a, yeah, it's content. It's just a, it's quantity. And then on this other hand, we have this very clinical uh, kind of expertise and there's Netflix documentaries about the wine, you know, the sommelier certification process where suddenly it's, it's like there, we all live somewhere in the middle of those two things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we almost have to live between those two things because we as humans can only fathom them so much of that pretension and we as practical bill paying adults in modern America <laughs> cannot always achieve that even though we are taught by every piece of media and marketing around us too it's mm-hmm. it maybe maybe it's just my windmill to tilt at but I really enjoy the idea of making this irreverent bridge so that the natty ice or the the um the Pittsburgh beer is just as important as drinking a you know 12 percent they only made one bottle Belgian <laughs> Chappelle yeah so absolutely okay so here's a question this is what i'm I'm wondering um this is both of you when you when you say you know like you're talking about a a whiskey experience or a wine experience right that's that's um what you're selling at on on some level right i don't need an exact percentage but i'm wondering like your clientele as i as i can i can envision in my head is going to break down along two levels right you're going to have people who um are the culturally sophisticated um, TM, you know, I'm using that term. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I'm using that term specifically, almost derisively, but you're going to, uh, but not, I don't, not totally derisively. You're going to have people from that world who know the difference between the tastes and who are coming to you for, for an expertise because you're like, you know, I am, I am having lamb tonight. What wine should I pair with it? Right. Like that is a, that is a, that is a question that I might have for my sommelier. Right. Mm-hmm. Now I also have, on the other hand, um, you know, I, I enjoy scotch. I'm not a scotch expert. I, but you know, I do enjoy drinking a scotch from not from here and there. And when I was in Scotland, I specifically went and did a scotch tasting because, you know, when else am I going to have an opportunity to do this, to do that? Right. So, but like, but like then I'm buying, I'm literally buying the experience, right? It's uh-huh. tor- like it, when you said about the thing is, you know, is the experience the football game or is the experience the, the wine, right? I'm, if I'm going on a wine tasting, if I'm going on a scotch tasting, if I'm going on a whiskey tasting, the experience is that, right? So I, the rules are almost different because the, that's now it's not the the alcohol is not an accessory it's not an it's not a garnish on the experience it's the event, it's the event. i'm yeah like, like it's you know you know i want i want someone to serve me whatever drink i'm whatever drink i order and i want you to explain to me how it was brewed 
you know, what the vintage means, all the things, all the pretentious things that like, if I were doing it in any other context would just be annoying. Right. Like, you know, I would like, if I'm doing it at, if I'm drinking a glass of wine while I'm at out at my theater event, just pour my damn wine so I can go back to like watching the play, you know, but like if I'm going to a wine tasting, I want to know about the vintage. That's why I'm here. Yeah, and I think that when you're one of the things I see too, when uh, in terms of knowledge and consumption is there's a certain class anxiety or cultural anxiety about not knowing enough about, I think wine has this far more than whiskey, but whiskey has developed it where uh -huh. oh, I don't, I don't know anything about this. Uh, yeah. What do I do? And mm -hmm. I imagine probably more for Kristen that some of your job is easing people's social anxiety and just letting them drink what they want to drink. And yes, I mean, I just feel that's part of what I love about this little jazz and juice series I'm doing is because I I'm that way too. You know, I feel like I can't, I can't have this experience because I don't know enough. I'm mm -hmm. not like, I'm not intellectually worthy of talking about music or wine because I haven't read all the books or whatever. Some, whatever my standard is, is unachievable. Like there's some unachievable level of knowing everything that I you know, feel guilty that I'm not at. And I feel like this like weird guilt for people that are curious about these things can take over and really overshadow the pleasure, which is the point. And I guess I feel like, you know, I'm the kind of person where uh, in my less great moments, I'll go to a museum and sometimes I'll read the plaque on the wall before I've even looked at the painting, mm -hmm. be reading about it. And I'm like, no, 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 the experience is to the right. And is I'm it? like, I'm like, I need to learn about it. And it's like, can we feed, you know, we, we go to a tasting going, Oh, let me stuff my head enough so that I can actually have a full body sensual experience. That makes almost no sense. So I wonder mm -hmm. if it's possible. And this is what I mean, I'm, I think part of my journey in this lifetime is, but certainly around these subjects is how how do we marry the intellectual fascination and the information we want to learn with uh, an experience in our lives in time, uh, you know, of pleasure and not lose sight of the either of 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 either side, because there's pure kind of hedonism and then there's this weird intellectual divorcement from ourselves and i think i think and pat speaking to this as well which is like they can go together knowledge can be pleasure but um we have to approach things a little differently i think we need the theater of folks like ourselves who can do that approach well and i wonder mm. is is there a way to do this without privileging one or the other right like you said so even in Kristen's story you're talking about reading the plaque first and saying you're denying yourself the experience but are you maybe you're just the kind of person who likes to enjoy like who enjoys like knowing the thing about what you're looking at right because I'm, I'm think, i mean because i'm thinking about like again with with alcohol right if if i'm talking about just the experience right like if the if if the only thing that matters or the most important thing that matters is the experience then both of your careers are stupid because the most fun I've ever had, the most fun I've ever had with alcohol was when I was 21 and getting shit faced, you know, like, like that was the most pure fun. I had a blast. I think I, I get you some better wine, man. Well, 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 well I mean, I uh, was uh, bringing you to the bar. Marone, <laughs> Marone knew me back then. Um, my life, my life was very designed around fun at that point. <laughs> so to the extent that I remember it, yes, I had a blast. Right. I, I, I'm too old to have that level of fun anymore. Um, oh, boo, boo. Oh, no, 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 no. The level of fun that I had um, when Would you kill me now. Yes. I'm, I'm like, literally my liver cannot handle it. Um, at some point I need to sleep at least once every 72 hours. And that was not true at this point. <laughs> so it, was, it was a different world. Um, it was a different map and a different time, but I mean, but that's, but like, I, but that doesn't mean I'm not enjoying, like I enjoy now I now there's a point in my life where I might still enjoy getting drunk. Right. But it is kind of fun. Like when I went to Scotland, it was kind of fun listening to them talk about the difference between this 20 year, this 40 year, this 12 year, this um, th this single malt, this double like just like learning stuff. Am I going to be an expert? No, I don't need to be. But just listening to him talk about it for like two straight hours where, you know, where I tried like a dozen different scotches, like a sip of each one. That was kind of neat, you know, and this is what a lot of tastings are like is someone yeah. telling you how to feel about something or what something tastes like. And it can be fun and entertaining 
cleaning. But I don't know. My sister came back when she took a trip to Napa a long time mm-hmm. ago. And she said, well, she's like, I went to all these wineries and it, they said, I'm an expert in what I like. Yes. And I thought, well, there That's, you yeah. have it. That's it. <laughs> and, sh- and shouldn't that be, shouldn't that be, I mean, but I think that, I think that you can like, you can like the experience of going, right? That's why like neither of you work for free, right? Like people are paying you, <laughs> paying you a service the because yeah. they, they presume, <laughs> they presumably like to, you know, people like to learn, right? Like, okay. So, so my, my job is like, I teach literature for a living, but you know, most everybody who hires me by, you know, effectively goes, you know, they go to college, but effectively they're hiring me. They all learn to read when they were five or six or 10 or, you know, like they, they yeah. they're like, well, but I mean, they're effectively done with the, the actual process of learning to read, to translate letters on paper into, um, into words in your head. Anybody who's gotten into college learned that that long before college because otherwise we wouldn't let you in right so you're you're in theory paying me to tell you how to appreciate a level of culture on some level that you know if i if i'm not just patting myself on the back isn't strictly necessary in order to enjoy the act of reading right like it, mm-hmm. like i'm 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 selling a level of expertise that's what my job is it's being an expert in a in a level that you don't necessarily have to be but that there's value in hiring i think god i hope so otherwise this show my career like everything is just like a loss well, I, th- I love <laughs> the literary the literary comparison is is so great because i feel like once we start talking about james joyce once we start talking right. about the rarest finest wines or whiskeys or even like really dense complicated music or the great sacred texts of all humankind you, you can't mm-hmm. go there alone you yeah. can't you know you can't just like pick it up and go OK, I mean, maybe for some people it makes sense, but usually there, ha- you know, you have to be aided along by somebody who can you know, be your Virgil and teach you a little bit about the history and what informs something and help you enjoy it. I mean, I've, I've had some of my most pleasurable learning experiences because of a teacher like yourself that sort of opened up something for me. So I guess why wouldn't wine or spirits be different than that? I hope it would be. I mean, and I don't I don't know if this is true for wine, because on, on some level, on some level, if I drink enough wine, I'm going to get drunk. Right. Like, so that's that. that I at least have something going on, going for it, right? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. regardless of how cheap or expensive it is. Um, the, you know, I, and maybe I'll at least, you know, hopefully I'll at least enjoy the taste of it. Or if I don't, I'll switch to a different wine, right? But with books, I, I would you become imagined. a little bit more philosophically musing the more you read James Joyce's no. weaving through the page. No, no, you don't. I, no, you don't. It's, I mean, that's bullshit. People will say that, <laughs> but you don't. Um, I, I, I don't. I, if you are, if you are, um, stuck on a desert island and by yourself never speaking to another human being again it's wake yeah there's there's no <laughs> there's no purpose to the great the great cultural experiences like you know if you're if you're the last man on earth uh fast and furious monty python uh you know like these things are better than reading james joyce um you don't i want to read the, the drunken show. text of a guy who sent a bunch of dirty things to his wife no and and i and i've said before i don't i i acknowledge why faulkner's important faulkner's not good i <laughs> there's no reason for for anybody to ever read this other than the cultural aspect of we decided that he was supposed to be important. So let's, you know, let's analyze him. But like, but there's no reason to do it for fun. Whereas so, so like, is that, but, but if you enjoy that process, so I'm saying this knowing full well that um, one of my professors, you know, one of my favorite professors, in fact, loves Faulkner and he thinks he's great. He's wrong. And I've told, this would, you know, thank God, God we're not at your listening. bar, Pat. We could be drinking brown spirits. There'd be some fun. <laughs> oh, the problem yeah. is, is that I want to jump in on this conversation, but I'm friends with a bunch of brand ambassadors for brands I don't always love and they know it. And I don't want to give them the same aneurysm your professor currently has listening to this podcast. Right. <laughs> right. But, th- but that's the thing. And, I, and, I, and it's not even it's not even to call names out. It's just like um, now when I say he's wrong because I have a show and he doesn't. And I can say that. Right. But uh, but but no, really, Realistically, he would say I'm wrong. He would say I'm wrong for not liking him. The, and that's fine. The agreeing to disagree in that mm-hmm. very essence is that same sort of irreverence that both of us have been playfully talking mm-hmm. around since we started introducing ourselves. There's a right. there's a necessity of going, well, I, I I don't think of myself as an expert because I'm constantly craving and learning, but that doesn't mean I can't talk about it for an hour and change easily. And mm, okay. inside baseball speed, 
because there is uh, I, th- I think humans are naturally curious some of us have been taught to shut that curiosity down and those people bore me people who are curious <laughs> about what they're drinking get more of my attention because okay. if they're even hesitant or they start to bumble on a couple questions, it's not about the eloquence of the question. It means that they're actually curious about what they're putting in their body, which then gives me the opening to create that experience as a teacher, essentially, mm-hmm. for the drinking experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a very different kind of bartending than the corner bar. Yes, well, yes, that's another. That's yeah, mm-hmm. that is a fair point. There are there are lots of different bars. Some of them just uh, they they want the eighteen dollar white wine to go with their their dinner and, and yeah maybe i'm maybe i'm just lucky to be in the privilege of this particular bar that's fair well, that's why i mean we have the both of you here because you're both pretty high level experts in your fields but your fields include like the rest of the iceberg is very big yes and something that i think becomes interesting so i live in astoria new york which used to be a very greek neighborhood still is one of the things that you can find in any, any liquor store here is ouzo which you know yep. traditional Mm-hmm. Greek Mediterranean drink. So I knew nothing about Uzo six months ago. And I decided, you know, I'm someone who's interested in alcohol. Let's go to the liquor store that has eight kinds of Uzo and let's add, <laughs> let's, let's talk to the guy. And I said, you know, listen, I know nothing about Uzo, please teach me. Where do I start? Like, where, yeah. where do I start? Mm-hmm. And I had a really, and you know, Uzo, I don't know, like, you know, I've tried a few different kinds now, and it's definitely interesting, and it has not reached the level of refinement that we see in scotch or wine. But it was definitely there was a whole thing around. And this is the way you drink it. This is how much water you add. This is this one is the classic. This one is this. This one is the variation. And that kind of same structure exists for other alcohols. And Kristen's point earlier about the the alcohols that are indigenous to one area or another Something that has become as universalized as wine does get fragmented rituals. Something as universalized as whiskey gets fragmented rituals. Something as specific as ouzo, you end up taking the rituals from the people who introduce it to you. So Mm -hmm. when you go back into wine or whiskey, one of the things that I'm curious about, because I see a certain knowledge of alcohol as useful social skills. If you were, you know, teaching someone you're about to enter society, you know, your 21st birthday you do the 21st birthday thing but you're you're about to go to a business meeting where there's going to be a whiskey tasting a wine tasting what's the crash course of what you should know as a functional adult in this circumstance yeah i mean i think it, it's funny for a brief period of time i had a, a consulting business where my plan was to teach people in business about these things and um mm-hmm. you know now i'm a little bit more philosophical about all this and i think when we start asking questions everybody wants to talk at a cocktail party about wine or whiskey or any of these mm-hmm. things. I think we can all agree to that. And uh, I think the big question is when we ask about wine or, or alcohol, we're asking what's your relationship to pleasure? And, um, you know, it's very revealing. Are you defensive about how um, about how lowbrow your tastes are and how you're you you want them to stay that way? Are you arrogant about um, how you'll only do, you know, do this? And it's very like cost prohibitive. Like, do you protect yourself from experience and pleasure or do you uh, bring curiosity to the table. And that's one of what it's a, what Pat was saying, you know, that curiosity to me, regardless of if your palate enjoys, you know, big reds or, or sparkling mm-hmm. whites, that's the most fascinating thing. And I guess for me, uh, trying to maintain that curiosity, even while we add a lot of knowledge to the, to the four is, um, is a challenge. Like we're talking about literature, right? You start developing strong opinions, can't help it once sure. you start to know about mm-hmm. something. So it's like, okay. And as people who are trying to lead other people to experience how do I continue to kind of not make myself a blank slate but continue to cultivate the curiosity rather than just you know saying this is the right way to experience pleasure through drinking I mean what a what an off-putting way to be <laughs> yeah. but I mean I, I'm and I've I've run into people where that's their thing right in, in literature and in alcohol right like they're I've I've 
I certainly know people who are, well, why are you reading that garbage? And, you know, the, the, I only read sophisticated literature. I know, <laughs> I know long tenured college, college professors who are like, no, no, no. The only, you know, they're not canonized. This is not special. You know, this is, this is, you know, here's the real literature. Real literature are these 15 dead white guys. That's it. You know, like I, like there are people who have that fundamental belief and they're not me and I can make fun of them because again, I've got my own show. So um, <laughs> like, and who can stop me? But like that's same thing happens. Same thing. I imagine was going to happen with alcohol, right? Like, you know, you know, why are you drinking natty ice? What are you a savage? You know, <laughs> like 15 dead white guys controlled the bourbon market for about a hundred years. Sure. And, and why, and, and that can't, you, you both said at, at some level, you've got to go with, you know, you're an expert in knowing what you like. Right. Like, and, yeah. and uh, one would hope that, I wanted to interject, like for, for my sister, that was what she was true. And that's, I think the difference between a professional and a non-professional is a non-professional can be an expert in what they like. But if you're a professional, it's kind of your job to be an ex to know a lot about things that you don't like. <laughs> yes. But I would hope, and again, I, I can't speak for both of you, but I would hope in for any cultural expert, part of, uh, well, I, and I shouldn't say that I know this is not true because I'm just talking about the cultural experts I was just talking about with literature. But my my goal as as a literary critic, as a pop culture critic, is always to be I don't have to like this myself. I want to be able to bring something to the conversation that enhances it rather than just shutting it down because I don't like it. Right. Like I'm te I'm teasing Faulkner because he's dead. And what's he going to do? Right. Like, you know, and because I'm making fun, I'm making fun of people. But like if you like Faulkner. I know like the professor I was talking about is a friend of mine. I know he legitimately likes Faulkner. Right. I like uh, if you're a regular listener to this show, you've heard me and Hannah tease each other a million times about good place versus Riverdale, which one's the best show in the history of television? <laughs> as though, as though those were the only two options, right? As though there haven't right. been a million television shows, you know. And and knowing full well that you know this is the answer is I really like one of those shows. Hannah really likes the other show, and frankly, in real life, we actually both kind of like both. It's fine, you know. But but, but like that's uh, well, the correct but, answer is that Legends of Tomorrow is better than both of them. But that's not important to this conversation oh, right I, now. I, 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 I wouldn't put it. Top ten. I wouldn't say number one this up this week. You know, just giving 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 hints of um when when we're recording versus when it's airing. I'm happy that mm -hmm. Zari 1.0 was back. Having Zari 1.0 and Zari 2.0 on the same show, kind of interesting, kind of fascinating. If you're not watching Legends of Tomorrow, right? you really should. Really great show. Um, yeah, it has nothing you can to do with me. Another time, I'll put a different hat on. <laughs> it's really interesting though. These kinds of conversations around the arts, like I, I'm of two minds. One part of me detests conversations about like the top ten jazz singers of all time or like battling out two bands. But I also know that if we're having impassioned conversations about what, what two things, you know, what's better in this, you know, rubric of two things, it really enlivens the whole thing. So I feel like, you know, I wouldn't want to take the claw, the teeth out of um, talking about pieces of culture that may not be popular mm -hmm. because when we, when we talk like this, it's exciting. I mean, that's the kind of, yeah. uh, you know, like it's competition. Really well, it's also it's that really line debate. between, oh, absolutely. <laughs> But it's also that connor connoisseurship versus snobbery line again, because there's a mm -hmm. way about it where it's like I'm proving my superior knowledge as a cultural status thing versus I like this thing and this is why. Tell me about the thing you like and why. And let's compare notes. And uh, mm -hmm. I have a, a good friend who said to me once that the difference between a whiskey snob and a wine snob and he has been proven wrong, but it's a great it's a great line is that the wine snob wants to talk to you about this one wine that they had 10 years ago and there's no more bottles and they'll never <laughs> taste it. And the whiskey snob says, hey, you need to try this. Like and this I've is done to Marone in the span of an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so true. I have to say, you know, working in mm -hmm. wine retail, I felt like I was in therapy sometimes. People would come in and go, I, I had this bottle in Tuscany. We were on the vineyard. The winemaker opened it for us. And I'm like, I'm sorry to tell you, I could point to that exact bottle on the shelf right now. You're never going to drink that bottle ever again. Uh -huh. <laughs> it will yeah. never taste that way. It's it's like your high school girlfriend. It's that's just it's over. Yeah. And we need to find you something yeah. else. So, so you're well, and, and 
<laughs> Ran out Very time. happy big, for her. But, but is that is that is that a big part of how? how well, uh, actually, all culture. But I was, you know, definitely how alcohol consumption works, and but cultural consumption in general. Is it really is a big part of it really, you know, chasing the high of the high school girlfriend, right? Like, you, you know, is that really is that ultimately what you're doing? Like, like it, it ultimately speaking, like, why why do I try anything new ever? Right. And I know I know people who don't. Right. There are certainly people who are like, I have discovered that I like Natty Ice or Iron City or Bud or, you know, whatever. Right. This is the beer that I like. Why would I ever try another beer? I like that beer. What do you mean? Try wine. I like this beer whiskey. Why would I do that? Right. Like part because I'm not chasing my high school girlfriend. For me, I'm polyamorous. Right. But like, and (laughs) is there, there, and I don't know that, I don't know that that's a bad thing or a good thing. I think that, you know, if you're going to be, if you're going to be monogamous to one spirit, let you be right. But if all, but also I am perfectly, I am, I'm the guy who, if I walk into Patrick's bar tonight, and he says, and you've you got will. to try this. Well, I mean, it's going to be a far walk because Pittsburgh's far from New York. But, you yeah. know, if I leave now, um, <laughs> I'll be I'll there be by, there. like, you know. We stay. don't close until <laughs> 2 a.m. tonight. I'll be there. When you get but, your ass to New York, we're, go, we're going to his bar. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and Kristen, and, of course, and when always I do, welcome back. Oh my gosh, it's it's been a minute. I'll, I'll have, I need to get your your nights that you're on okay. <laughs> later. But, but when I but when I walk in, I'm gonna say I'm, if, when I walk in, I'm the kind of guy who are gonna be like, "What should I try?" And Patrick's gonna be like, "You've got to try this." And I'm like, absolutely right. Like that's that's just me. And I I think both things have got to be okay, right? Like, but like that's part yeah. of the culture. Like you're you're sell, if you're selling the experience of, <laughs> and it's okay. Well, just I don't like gin. Does that mean gin can't be good? No, it's just an alcohol I happen to dislike. Um, I've never had one where I've been like, oh, I'm wrong. This is a good gin. No, pretty much all of them have been like, this is shitty tasting. Listen, I know a girl who does what I do with whiskey with gin and she can fix that. And probably. And, and, you know, and like maybe and maybe that's the maybe that's what I need as opposed. But but at some point, it's at some point. It just got to the point where I was like, no, I'll just drink nine martinis with vodka. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and I, and I, and I think, I think either of those things have to be okay is what, what I'm getting at. And I don't, I don't know that there is a wrong or right answer. Uh-huh. There is, I mean, it's, it's just, I, I wanted to get this show up because I think it's, there's so much variety in the culture of alcohol and mm-hmm. having like, I think whiskey and wine are the two with the biggest presence. So having, so we've resolved nothing. We have resolved nothing. <laughs> I mean, that's right. <laughs> you can do this with some coffee and tea people next time. Like Absolutely. we've done alcohol, I mean, let's do caffeine. Or, or you coffee, said, I mean, you, people. you, you said, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned like cigars and marijuana, right? Like I, mm-hmm. I am not, a, you know, I, I mean, I mean, I'm a good boy who lives in Pittsburgh where, I, where weed is illegal. So I've never had any, but you know, if I had, <laughs> I could tell you, <laughs> I could tell you that I am not the guy who can distinguish between different, you know, uh, different effects and whether something's hydroponically grown or not. Like, like seriously, I would, I would be the guy who'd be like, no, just does this get me fucked up or not? That's what I want to know. Um, but, but on the other hand, I know people who like, I have, I have, okay. I have been to dispensaries in California where people will, where, where you walk in and the, you know, the very studied gentleman behind the counter says, no, no, no. What effect do you want for how long? And, you know, you know, would you like to smoke this or eat this different weed is for different things. <laughs> you know, like, like, I, like di- <clears throat> culture is so that? different because we're talking about just effects. And I feel like when yeah. you talk about whiskey and wine, the effect is kind of part of it, but we're having an experience of taste and mm-hmm. all, it's like a, it's, I, I think of more, sensual and cohesive pleasurable experience rather than just a conversation about results like I can't yeah. that, that, I, that never that, computes for me very parallel with right. coffee and tea yep but I also know that having talked to people who are very into weed culture they would absolutely disagree with you and have the exact same like they would they would sell up their version of it for the exact opposite reasons you know where, where they're, where they're and, 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 and I think that but I think that's what makes makes culture interesting right like uh, like is the answer like what's the answer 
of, you know, what's the right way to enjoy a culture or a substance or an alcohol or a coffee or, tea, you know, and like, I don't know. I don't know that there is a right way or a wrong way. What makes it interesting, what makes culture interesting is that there are multiple viewpoints, which are fun to talk about. Yeah. And yeah. it exists outside the world of right and wrong. It's like mm-hmm. that binary yes. isn't even relevant, really. I like that. It exists outside the world of right and wrong. That's this show, Vox Podcast. We exist That's outside a very the different right philosophy right argument, wrong. though. What is right and wrong? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that's you know. another show. <laughs> we can't resolve that either. <laughs> no. but That's I why we delve into all... the pleasures and the sense, the sensual natures of our joys, our vices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I want to thank all three of you for coming on. This has been great. Um, it's uh, always an easy show where I don't have to like know anything, so I can just listen to most of it. So, thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, thank, thank you all you for indulging me and in getting them on here. So, yeah, oh my gosh, so much fun. Yeah, Maroon, I'll do. I'll do you first. You've been on before, but you know, where can people find you and your endeavors and whatever, whatnot? I could be found on my website, MaroonLongsner.com, which points to the various things I do. I am going to be restarting production on my narrative podcast, Slippery Slope. So uh, once my parallel career hits a little bit of a slow point, which will probably happen in a few months, we're going to restart production there. I will send you those links and I will throw it to Kristen and Patrick. Great. Well, th- th- this is, I just want to echo that this has been so much fun. Uh, right now, um, I'm building the Jazz and Juice website. So there's not much there for you at, at this moment, but um, depending on when you listen, those sites could be ready to go jazz n the letter n juice.com in the meantime uh the best way to get in touch with me and to see you know all the different ways if you want to connect to my music or to the jazz and juice series is probably to find me on social so my name is Kristen lee Sargent. i'll probably give my uh the podcast plus my instagram uh up here uh there's lots of ways to find me but i'm refining the ways you can find me uh as we speak so and where can we buy your wine ah um well our wine is distributed if you live in Atlanta, Georgia, we're available there. And if you live in New York City uh, and parts of New Jersey, it's available. So I would go um, to winesearcher.com and put two notes wine. Um, you can find uh, our website. Also, a couple stores where we're available. Uh, Oak and Steel in Midtown Manhattan always has us in stock. And as things reopen, we'll be in restaurants and stuff like that. So um, there's not a ton of it, but I would love for uh, everyone, anyone who likes Bordeaux. Uh, would enjoy this California red blend and Patrick. Yeah. Um, you can find all of my information at Patrick Uh, I've already kind of teased that I do a lot of things other than just whiskey. Uh, you can also, if you're interested in, uh, talking more about private tastings uh, in person. Thank God. Now that New York is back up and running and I'm fully vaccinated uh, at barrover.com. So patrickmarin.com, barrover.com. Uh, also Pat Marin and the Bar Rover on Instagram and uh, Pat Marin on Twitter. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all three of you. Um, you can follow me as always on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, all of the places, always at Chris Maverick. You can follow the show, all those same places at Vox Popcast. You can also follow the show's blog at www.voxpopcast.com where we talk about whatever we're talking about next week. I don't even remember what next week's show is because I've lost track but go there. uh, Follow us on the socials or on our blog and find out what our next topic is. Give us your thoughts. Pitch yourself as a guest for the show um, or just tell us what you want us to talk about. It's always interesting. If you enjoy the show and we certainly hope you do then subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever the hell else you get podcasts from and do us a favor leave us a five-star review especially on itunes apple Podcasts. that tweaks the algorithm makes us more popular helps other people find the show and makes me feel good about myself and you know if you can make me feel good about myself by leaving a five-star review instead of by me just getting shit face drunk isn't that better okay or you can like also just send me alcohol to get shit fake struck with them. I'll take either. But anyway, you could also subscribe to us on our YouTube channel in where you can follow the show. You can see visual representations of, you know, of what we're talking about. And I would once again like to thank all three of my guests for joining me. I'd like to thank Maximilian of Thoughtform Music for our epic theme song, building ever so more epically and playing us out. I'd like to thank you at home for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye! <laughs>